I greet you all in Jesus mighty name life bridge church family what a beautiful privilege for me to come to you through this uh, medium of video and uh, I pray that today's message will truly bless you and I'm eagerly waiting for the day I can come and visit you all again truly I miss you all and uh, you all have been in my thoughts and prayers over the last several uh, months and uh, I know that as we enter into the month of March and the first week of April it's a season when we have the most important event in the Christian calendar the Easter uh, the death the resurrection of Christ is being observed or celebrated uh, all over the world and leading to this season uh, as a church we will be focusing on topics that relates to uh, the death and resurrection of Christ and what that means for each one of us as believers in Christ. And so today uh, what a beautiful passage we have in the Gospel of John chapter 14 verses 1 to 6. So the title of our message today is called Pathway to Comfort. How we can find comfort in the midst of turmoil, challenges, fears, anxi anxieties. And I came across the story of this woman who had been having trouble uh, getting sleep at night because she feared that uh, burglars will come into her house every night at the moment lights are switched off and she lays on the bed eyes closed she has this fear and anxiety that burglars are going to enter her house and so for years for decades she has not been sleeping well uh, at all at night so one night her husband heard a noise in the house as they went to bed and so he went downstairs to investigate well uh, as he went down there, there was a burglar, there was a thief who entered the house. And so the owner of the house told the thief, good evening. Uh, and uh, um, and the, 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 the burglar was surprised. Why is this man saying good evening? And then the man said, I'm so glad to see you. Come upstairs and meet my wife. She has been waiting for you for the last 10 years to meet you. Uh, what, a, what an interesting story of how fear and anxiety can be turned into something uh, like this um, and, and, and it's so interesting that what we fear is the worst, what we are anxious about often end up actually having in our experiencing in, in our life. One of the things that God wants us to experience is comfort. One of the things that God wants us as children is to be comforted and the Bible says that God comforts us as a mother comforts his children. Instead of worry, God wants us to experience peace in our heart. Instead of anxiety, God wants us to have inner quietness or inner calmness. When life is rough on the outside, he wants in the inside of us to be calm. If you look at Psalm 131 verse 2, it says, I have calmed and quieted myself uh, like a weaned child who no longer cries for its mother's milk. As a wean child is my soul within me. A, a child who's been well fed, a child who's been well taken care, uh, has the most beautiful, comfortable sleep you can ever find. Now if you turn to Proverbs chapter 17, uh, verse 27, uh, it says, The one who knows much says little. An understanding person remains calm. A person who is of a man of wisdom and understanding remains calm. He does not babble on. He doesn't speak much. One of the reasons why we let things like worry, anger and fear and bitterness get a hold on us is because there are some things that we don't understand about God. And there are some things that we don't understand about the situation that are happening in our life. Or there are some things that we don't even understand often about ourselves let alone we understand, we struggle to understand about other people many times. So understanding and wisdom, these are two, two things, uh, two weapons that we can use against the attack of the enemy to bring worry and fear over uh, the situation, about God, about ourselves, about others. When we have that clarity, the understanding and the wisdom, we can actually calm ourselves. Isaiah chapter 7 verse 4 says, Calm down and be quiet. Don't be afraid or cowardly because of those two smoldering sticks. 
King Ahas uh, was being threatened by two other kings in this particular story in Isaiah chapter 7. And God is telling King Ahas through prophet Isaiah to calm down and be quiet. I don't know about you. Have you had people in your life that have told you sometime or the other, hey, calm down, be quiet. And, and that's actually a good advice as much as we don't like that advice. It's, it's really a good advice for us to sometimes to zip, to shut up, to be quiet. God wants you and I to experience that inner comfort even though you may be uh, threatened or have legitimate reasons to be really stressed out about situations in your life. But how do you do that? How can you and I grow in understanding and wisdom and have the inner comfort that the Bible is talking about? And that's exactly what Jesus is addressing in John chapter 14, which is our key test today. John chapter 14, verses 1 onwards. And we will look at the first uh, six to seven verses, especially leading to the season of Easter coming up in a few weeks time. As a church, we will be focusing on the death and the resurrection of Christ. And it's appropriate for us to focus on the time leading to his death and leading to his burial, leading to his resurrection. Some of these post Easter events uh, as we unpack John chapter 14. Uh, we will have some applications on this topic that we are talking about. How can we obtain? How can we lead to that pathway of comfort in our lives? To paint a picture of the context of John chapter 14, it is called the famous upper room discourse, the conversation that Jesus had with the disciples. Now, by this time, you must remember, Jesus' public ministry is coming to an end. He had been rejected by the nation of Israel and that he is soon going to be crucified. He had now entered into a private time with the disciples whose hearts are filled with sorrow and anxiety for a very good reason. Jesus had just announced in John chapter 13, the last verses, if you look, you will find he's announcing to them that he is going to leave them after being with them for all this time. So Jesus said to his disciples in chapter 14, John chapter 14, verse 1, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe again in me. In my father's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and pre prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may also be you know the way to the place where I'm going. And Thomas, the disciple, said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus answered and said, I am the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So that's John chapter 14, verse 1 to 6, our meditation for today and what we can glean from the teachings of Jesus, how we can have a comforting heart. What are the pathways to finding comfort. Martin Luther calls this passage the best and most comforting sermon that the Lord Jesus Christ delivered on earth. A treasure and a jewel not to be purchased with the world's goods. In the sentence that we have just read, let your, your heart, let not your heart be troubled. Um, I'm not a, an expert in grammar, but as I studied, it says it is a verb, a, a present passive imperative meaning to stop an action which is already going on. He wasn't saying to the disciples, don't start worrying now. He was saying, you're already worried, but I want you to stop it. You're already freaking out about what is going to happen, but I want you to stop it. Stop worrying now. To put it more clearly and simply, what Jesus is saying here in simple English, it means let not your heart be troubled. <laughs> It's a command. It's an imperative to be obeyed, just like any other command that Jesus gave. It's a command that one, may, one must be obeyed. It's an imperative. And so every time we, we are troubled in our heart and we are not um, paying attention to what Jesus is saying to calm ourselves and stop worrying, we are disobeying the command of the Lord Jesus. We must remember that. Uh, now, how you feel about things in our lives often cannot be controlled. You know, the, the things that are going to happen to us, things that are happen, happening in us, the things that are happening around us, that we have no control over those things. 
whether it is elections whether it is family crisis whatever it is but how you react to those situations and how you feel about those situations can be controlled god would not give us a command and he will not tell us let your heart not be troubled if he has not given us the power not to control the fear and the anxieties that we have he has given us the power and the ability to do that and that's why he has given us that command in fact god never asks us to do something that where his grace is not sufficient for us and so what is jesus saying to us how can we have this comfort how can your heart be not be troubled and he goes on to give us four pathways to comfort so leading to this easter season let's unpack those four pathways that we can apply in our lives number 1 jesus is saying to believe in a person who is this person that we must believe in well we must believe in jesus in fact the jewish people in the old testament if you look at deuteronomy chapter 31 verse 6 the basic tenet of their faith was on god they had uh, such a faith in god it says in deuteronomy chapter 31 verse 6 Verse six, he says, "Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or tremble at them, for the Lord your God is the one who goes with you. He will not fail you or forsake you." Friends, this is the Jewish people and their understanding of Yahweh. You see, as children, when I had my kids when they were small, you know, often when they cry at night. either a mom or dad comes near them and we embrace them or we take care of them and we walk them uh, walk them around they immediately uh, find comfort and they fall asleep and sometimes i find when they were small they would hold on to your hand they won't let go of their hand even while they were sleeping they just want to know that mom or dad is near them and so just as a a child when afraid at night looks to his parent to provide comfort you know and just as a child looking to cling on to mom and dad we also need to cling on to our god hold on to his hand and that's what the jewish people did down through the centuries and now jesus is basing their faith to a whole new level and saying it is the same god that you had had faith in that is me i am i am god i'm 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 jesus I am the son of God. I want you to have faith in me. Just as you had faith in the invisible God, put your faith in me as well. And that's exactly what Jesus is saying. And he demonstrated his his sovereignty and his authority through his miracles and through his life on earth, walking on the water, calming the storms and healing the sick, raising the dead. And all these miracles that Jesus performed Obviously only God could do those things. So Jesus was telling the disciples if you want to experience my strength if you want to experience my power in your life right now in facing what is ahead of us you need to trust me. You need to put your faith in me. Hallelujah. Jesus was saying to believe in what I say but also believe in who I am. As much as you believe in what I'm saying believe in the person of Jesus. Jesus was, was Jesus was asking them to believe in a person. So let me ask you a question today. Do you really trust him? Do you believe in Jesus, the person, just as much as you believe in the words that he has spoken as you have read in the Bible, hearing messages every Sunday? Do you believe not just in his words, but do you believe in the person of Jesus? Because whatever he says, he will do. have you placed your faith in him for your salvation that's the first and foremost question so that's what jesus is saying to the disciples to experience comfort in your brokenness in your troubles you need to believe in a person let's move on to what jesus says in number 2 he is telling the disciples let not your heart be troubled believe in me but also believe in a place and that is number 2 the second pathway to comfort is to believe in a place Now Jesus is describing the, to the disciples what heaven look like. He's saying there is a place called heaven. Friends, if ever there is a time we need to be so heavenly minded, it is time now that this world and everything in this world is perishing. 
this world is in trouble and we need to keep our eyes on heaven. It is not just a figment of imagination or wishful thinking or it is something that we can just use to get through the present life but it's a real place. Sometimes we speak about heaven like to comfort people oh so and so passed away that person is in heaven and we just kind of pass it by and just take no serious attention to the reality of the place called heaven. Now the amazing thing about this place it's a it's a real place as I mentioned it, our heavenly father is there in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 13 to 18 Paul the apostle says that when you reach heaven you will be with your heavenly father you will also be with your Lord Jesus Christ. You will also be reunited with those believers who died before us. So we get to have this great celebration of reunion with uh, everything that is really important to us. But here Jesus in this narrative in John chapter 14 speaks of heaven as my father's house. Now his favorite name, Jesus' favorite name for God was my father. Remember the prayers? You know, the, the Lord's Prayer or when he prayed on that cross, it was always my father. Jesus, who had dwelt forever in the bosom of the father, came down to this earth so that he can, he can reveal to us what father God is like and what God has been through all eternity. Now, Jesus will be glorified by his death. And he was going to go back to his full glory with the father again in the father's house. Now in the New Testament, you must always, uh, when you study about heaven and when you study about eternity, you will find heaven is often called a country, like a nation. It is like um, emphasizing there is a vastness of heaven, how large and how big it is. Bible also talks about in the New Testament of heaven as a city because of the large number of inhabitants in, the, in heaven. So a country emphasizing its vastness, a city because of the large number of inhabitants. The Bible is also speaking of heaven as a kingdom because of its structure and order. So it's a kingdom where there is a king. The Bible also speaks of heaven as a paradise because of the of the beauty of the place. It's a paradise. But my favorite expression of heaven is this when John chapter 14, when he calls heaven as my father's house. I remember as a child, if I went to visit my relatives or I go for some church camp or I go away from home or even after I grew up and went to Bible college, it was always wonderful to have the opportunity to go back home. There I was welcome. I was accepted. I was free to be myself. I could just go right into my home at any moment. Um, remove my shoes, remove my shirts and just walk around however I feel like. Just lay on the floor or sit on the chair, relax. There is no place like home. In fact, our own home is the place where we are made feel, um, feel, uh, made feel important. Uh, if you are loved by the people of your home, there will be your pictures on, on the wall of your home. If you go to my home back in Kerala, you will find my mom even now has many of my pictures hanging on the wall. So when I go there, I feel like I have come home. So I want you to think of it this way. Heaven is a place that's our home. That's my place built my, by my father, my Jesus. Um, it's a place in heaven. And that's what Jesus wants the disciples to believe in. Not the, the, the earth that they were fighting for. Not for the Israel where they want to establish a kingdom and they wanted to rule with Jesus as the king of Israel. But God had a bigger plan. He's saying, I'm going to prepare a place for you. I want you to believe in that place called heaven. So what God is calling us today as, as each one of us live in this world with all the worries and troubles we face, let's live today with eternity in our heart. Believe in the Father's home. That brings us to the, to the third pathway for finding comfort. And that is found in verse 3, John chapter 14, verse 3. Jesus is saying, believe in a promise. When everything is ready, he says, I will come and get you 
so that you will always be with me where I am. Jesus is giving a promise to the disciples. When everything is ready, I will come again and get you. Jesus is reinforcing his comfort. Let not your heart be troubled by telling his disciples that he will return. Friends, our Jesus is returning. There is nothing more comforting to those of us who are alive right now on this earth than the assurance that Jesus could come back for us at any moment. And I pray that you have faith, you have belief in this promise today. Why did Jesus say when everything is ready? Well, he is referring to more than just heaven. God can create everything with a word. We know that in creation he did that. But everything, when he when Jesus mentioned the word everything, it includes the timing of his return. The timing when everything is ready, which he knows the timing. When God's purpose for this world, as we know, is over. When everything is ready, Jesus said, I will come and get you. Nobody knows when, but Jesus will return. There is a promise. He has kept every promise in his word. And he will keep this one too, I have no doubt. But until he returns, you and I need to live with the belief in the promise. Amen. Why is Jesus going to come and get us? Why he want to come and get us? Well, the following verse says, so that we will always be with him. God wants us to be with him. He wants you to be with him. He wants to hang out with you. He wants you to live with him forever. It's wonderful and nice to be wanted by someone. My spouse wants me around or my children wants me around and people that I work with, people that I love wants me around and it feels good to be made wanted. And think about the difference between being wanted and unwanted. If Somebody tells you, get out of this house. You don't belong here. I don't want you in my face. Move away. Go away. You feel rejected. You feel unwanted. But God is saying, no, I'm coming back. I'm coming to get you because I want to be with you. That is a deep statement, my friends, if you really think about it. So believe in the promise. And that brings me to the fourth and final pathway to comfort. Jesus says, believe in a plan. I have a plan for you. God always has a plan. Jesus is saying in verse, five, verse 4, and you know the way to where I am going. There is a plan of the place I am going. And verse 5, Thomas of all the disciples says, no, we don't know, Lord. We don't know the plan. We have no idea where you are going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus is saying to the disciples, the plan. I am the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father except through me. What an amazing plan of God unfolding. The answers to the cries of humanity, the plan and purpose of God revealed through Jesus Christ. So Jesus is telling Thomas, and he's telling us, you and me, those who don't know the way, he's saying, I am the way. I am the way to experience this place called heaven. What does that mean? Well, I'm reminded of this amazing experience I had many years ago. A friend of mine who is a, a politician in Chandigarh uh, organized this uh, evening coffee with the governor of Chandigarh. Just me and... Uh, my political uh, politician friend. Uh, we were uh, appoint, uh, We had this appointment to have coffee with the governor. And I remember me driving to the governor's house outside on the main road near the uh, um, lake. And we parked our car and then I had to be with my friend, my political friend from all the way from the gate, uh, passing through various checkpoints and doors. I had to be with this friend of mine who is a political leader who is connected to the governor. 
And as we went through each of the gates and checkpoints, it became more stricter and more. The doors became stronger. The checks were more intense. And finally, I was given access to areas in the governor's house that not many Chandigarh citizens have ever been. I had the beautiful experience of having coffee with the governor in his uh, private mansion. Now, how did I get to that place? What enabled me to be with the governor? If not for my politician friend who accompanied me, if not for his presence, I would not have been even allowed inside the first gate, let alone the other gates all the way leading to the governor's uh, living room. And that, that is exactly what Jesus has done. Because of Jesus, because of his presence and what he's done for us on the cross of Calvary, you and I have the opportunity because of the position and the authority that Jesus Christ has, we have access to the very throne of grace. Wow. What an incredible story. The day Jesus died, it says the curtain that separated you and me in the Holy of Holy, from the Holy of Holies, torn from the top to the bottom. and says, come on in, come into my very presence. Come and fellowship with me, God said, because of Jesus. As I conclude my message today, Jesus is speaking to us. Let not your heart be troubled. I came across this statistics, this study that is done about average people and their anxiety and how, what it is focused on. Uh, wh what is the anxiety and the worry that people get stressed over? And the breakdown of this, the percentage goes like this and says 40 percentage of things that we are anxious about, of you're fearful about, are things that will never happen. 40 percentage, that's a, a very high percentage of stress and worry that will never happen. 30 percentage of our stress and worry are about things of the past that cannot be changed. Things that happened, but there is no nothing that can be done about. By worrying, by stressing, we are not going to go back and change what has happened. 12 percentage of things that we get stressed and worried about are criticisms by others, mostly untrue. 12 percentage, criticisms and backstabbing what people said about us, gossips that are untrue. 10 percentage of our worry is about our health. <laughs> and the more we worry about that, the more stressed we become. You know, for a while I stopped taking my blood pressure because every time I take my blood pressure, it worries me more because my blood pressure is usually very high. And so when I see the, the readings, it stresses me more. How true that is. Eight percentage, eight percentage, only eight percentage are anxieties and worries about real problems that we have to face. Only eight percentage. That's a very minimum, very minute percentage compared to the other things. Listen, my friends, every tomorrow of our life has two handles. The handle of anxiety, the handle of faith. It's like riding the bicycle. The handle of anxiety and the handle of faith. We can grab one or the other. And if you're always grabbing onto the handle of anxiety, we're going to freak out. But if you're going to ha hold on to the grab, the handle of faith, we will be chilled, we will be relaxed. And because the Bible is one-fourth prophecy and things about the future, things that are yet to happen, there is a lot of handle of faith. There is a lot to have a handle of faith that we can hold on to for our future because the Bible speaks of a future that is bright. The Bible speaks of a future that is full of hope and God wants to give us life in the future. There was an unknown source uh, writing about a British or an English uh, officer. And this man, his name is Arthur. Arthur decided that in his life, he is going to worry only one day a week. He says, during the week, seven days a week, one day a week, I'm going to just assign it for worrying. Other days, I'm not going to worry about anything. So when anything happens on 
any other days he will set it apart that day to be a worry day and he chose wednesday every wednesday is going to be worry day so he would write down things that happened on monday or write down things that happened on friday or over the weekend things that he should worry about and say okay i'm going to open up this worry box on wednesday and deal with it and worry about it and so he did this but on wednesday morning when he opened the worry box and he goes through the list of things he already found out that most of the things that he has been worried or things that wanted to worry him has already been dealt with they've been settled and he didn't had no need to worry about what a beautiful way to deal with the situations uh, uh of worry in our life so as i conclude my message today my friends maybe you came to the church today troubled in your heart you are troubled about your marriage you are troubled about your finances you are troubled about your health you are troubled about people what we, people will think about you what people won't think about you what people might do to you what will happen to your children your grandchildren and i don't know what those worries are jesus says if you want to deal with the problem and troubles this world brings let me tell you how to keep that right frame of mind as you face them jesus is saying believe in me trust me depend on me jesus says place your faith in me for your salvation but also for guidance jesus is saying to us let not your heart be troubled believe in me jesus is saying let not your heart be troubled believe in my father's house believe in a person believe in a place believe in heaven believe it is real and that some day all these troubles will be over and that you will have rest you will have perfect peace all the disease all the sickness all the problems will be taken away and all that you have hoped for will be will become real in your life thirdly jesus is saying believe in my promise i will return i will return for my people i want you as a church all of us to expect that to happen expect jesus to return live today as though jesus is returning today look forward to that day that is the most important things there's two th- two days that are so important in a person's life and that is today and that day today is the day where you make the choice to believe in the promise and that day is the reality of the promise when jesus will come back today choose to believe in the promise of jesus believe in his word and finally believe in the plan what is that plan follow jesus his plan i am the way the truth and life prepare yourself to face this week that you will anchor your faith in the rock of our salvation our lord jesus christ draw close to him more believe him more as we prepare ourselves to the se- for the season of easter and and the resurrection let's believe in jesus let's put our faith in him let's believe in the place that he is preparing for us heaven let's our let our heart be so heavenly minded believe in the promise his word put our faith in his, in his word and believe in the plan and the purpose of god amen may the lord bless you through these words today